The topic for tonight in our Forbidden Topics uh, uh, series, lessons that'll get you criticized, called out or canceled. I, I called it that because nobody talks about this. You know, nobody talks about this. We have the other side, the non-believing side who practice and promote. But you know, we don't, we don't talk about these matters and they're important at least to know where should we stand? What do we believe about these things? So that's why um, I've uh, come up with these uh, topics to talk about during this uh, quarter. We're on lesson number eight and this particular topic this week entitled pornography and behavior uh, and the results from it, the results from it. So our session will be divided into several uh, sections. I'm gonna review the definition and the types of pornography, uh, a look at some uh, recent statistics concerning the most prevalent form of pornography and that is internet pornography. Oh boy, the perfect storm right there when the internet showed up. Internet porn is mostly what I'll be talking about when I talk about statistics and things like that tonight. Also a summary of the arguments for, believe it or not, there are arguments for pornography. People make a case for pornography. So I'm gonna review those briefly. And then of course, against the use of pornography. And then some ways to avoid or break the habit of consuming pornography. And that's what you do, you consume it. You know, people have no trouble thinking you consume alcohol or you consume drugs. They don't realize that you actually consume pornography. It goes inside of you. It has an effect on you. Okay, we're gonna talk about that. So as I mentioned for the lesson on gambling, one session is not enough to deal with this, uh, this complex issue, but hopefully it can be a help to inform and warn and encourage those who may be struggling uh, with this uh, issue. So we're only gonna do one, one session on porn, pornography. So what is pornography? Let's get a definition here. Porn A, which means prostitute, and graph means to write. Uh, definition is a depiction of sex acts in words or pictures. Uh, or film in order to cause sexual excitement. There is, here's the point, there is no pornography without an audience. Think about that for a second. There's no pornography without an audience. Without an audience, it's an orgy or it's just sex. Some examples, and by the way, I, I, there are no pictures, there's nothing graphic here, okay? So we're, I'm, I'm not out to shock you, I'm out to inform you, all right? So uh, different types, soft core, what is called soft core pornography. You know, movies with partial nudity and sex scenes where people are not necessarily completely naked. Uh, commercials that use sex to get your attention. Uh, books and magazine that use words and images in order to arouse sexually. And of course, internet, internet images that use sex to draw attention, what we call clicks, to get clicks. Sometimes uh, the topic has nothing to do with pornography or sex, but they use pornography to get your attention. You know, whoa, what? You know, and then the other type, Hardcore, hardcore pornography. Hardcore pornography, actual sex acts being performed. No hiding, no sheets covering, no dark lighting, none of that stuff. Actual sex acts being performed by people. Uh, violence uh, sometimes used to arouse the, the viewer. You know, movies that are rated X, uh, various magazines, Snuff films, which are the most despicable. Snuff films are films that portray the murder of an individual on video. Many times children. Children being actually murdered for the value of the video. 
so that they can then sell the video. It's, uh, it's uh, amazing. Human beings, what they'll do. You wonder, what do they do with the children? They, they never find those children that they kidnap. Well, many times those children that are kidnapped are used in this way. And then of course, the newest interactive sex websites where you can interact with the individual that's you know, on, the, on the TV or on your, on your monitor. You can speak to them, you can ask them things, you can ask them to do things and so on and so forth. Now, the, uh, the use of uh, words, images, or film to stimulate sexual response for a variety of reasons is widespread in our society. And regardless of what community standards are or what the courts say, our responsibility is to determine what our response to pornography is to be as Christians, as Christian people. So I want to focus on the internet, you know, tonight can't do all the different types, but internet porn is the major type nowadays. It's the fastest growing delivery system for pornography. Used to be movie houses, you know, that showed only pornography or stores that sold, you know, books, uh, pornography that, that had pornography. Uh, and there were clubs, you know, strip clubs, things like that, you know, and they were very popular maybe 30, 40 years ago, but not so today. I mean, think about it. In the privacy of your home, uh, you can access, you can watch, you can even participate in uh, uh, almost any type of uh, pornographic uh, material uh, uh, that you can think of. And, and, and nobody knows. Uh, th th that was one of the restraining things. <laughs> you didn't want to get caught walking out of the porn store or out of the porn movie. Oh, Joe, what are you doing here? You, know, you, 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 you didn't want to risk that. Maybe you had your stuff delivered and they always said, you know, discreet delivery, meaning they'd wrap your stuff up, your movie or your magazines or whatever in brown paper, you know, and, uh, and, and send it to you, you know. But none of that anymore now, you know. The privacy of your home, you bring it all into your, into your home. In 2000, in the year 2000, I researched statistics for internet pornography for a class that I was teaching at Oklahoma Christian University at the lectures. So I kept those stats and I wanna show you the statistics from 2000 and compare them to the statistics on internet pornography that I found for this year. Well, actually for 2020, it's hard to get for 2021. So let's take a look at that real quick. Year 2000, 3,700 known porn sites. That's 21 years ago. That's a long time in internet years, okay? Uh, habitual users that they were guessing about 200,000 habitual users and the revenue maybe $400 million a year, which was you know, a pretty large uh, industry. Uh, we move ahead uh, to uh, uh, 2020, 80 million porn sites. Now, anytime you think, you know, uh, uh, our, little, our little Bible talk website, you know, is making a real big dent because we have, you know, lots of people going to it. We're nothing in comparison to, to porn sites. <laughs> They have, more, they have more porn sites than we have views. Like, okay, we have maybe 10 and a half million views. They have 80 million sites. <laughs> Talk about David and Goliath. There are more users of pornography than Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter combined. Combined. 35% of all downloads are porn related. I don't mean 35% of all downloads from porn sites. I mean 35% of all downloads everywhere are porn related. The number one porn site entitled called Pornhub 
has 16 million viewers per day, per day. And the revenue, $97 billion a year. You imagine what we could do if we had $97 billion to invest in preaching the gospel? <laughs> now the sad, really sad thing is the United States has the most daily visits to the Pornhub site, more than any other country in this country. We have more users of pornography in this country than in any other country in the world. Now remember, I'm only talking about the number of users and revenue for internet pornography. I'm not talking about the movies and the books, which as an industry was generating $7 billion in revenue back in uh, 2000 and has grown since then. I don't have the numbers for 20. 21. So pornography, uh, therefore, is a big business, especially in the United States, and a tremendous moral and spiritual problem in this society, and it's getting worse. The new, you know, the newest thing, the new number one search online is for VR porn virtual reality pornography. You know those big goggles that people put on and when they put those goggles on, they're like in another world. They may be just in their living room, but in, in, in the virtual reality goggles, they're like in Hawaii or something. You know, they get a, it's just like being in Hawaii. Well, they're developing uh, uh, VR pornography is the latest Fat, can you imagine? Its, uh, its popularity, of course, is growing, especially with children under the age of 15, as well because they have free and easy access to the internet where they are easy targets for those who produce and sell pornography. The average age of exposure to pornography of some kind is 11 years of age, 11 years of age. And most at-risk youth are in the 12 to 17 age group. Just, I'm saying to you, grandparents, great-grandparents and parents, be very careful when you hand over a phone to your children. Be very careful when you hand over a phone to your child. They might innocently type in Wonder Woman. You know, you and I, Wonder Woman, yeah, the movie, the comic book, you know, the, the hero. But there are other Wonder Women online that they will get if they type that in or Superman or whatever. Innocent titles will bring up not very innocent material. You have to be, you have to be on guard. And I don't mean punish, I mean teach, educate, warn. So enough about statistics. Let's look at the arguments for and against pornography and its consumption. Let us begin with arguments for pornography. Many arguments to support the production and the distribution of pornography. Here's the first one. It's good for you. <laughs> this, is, this is also called the catharsis argument the catharsis argument, and it goes like this, the psychological argument. It says, we all have sexual feelings, okay? We all have violent tendencies, maybe. We all have weird ideas that we can't express. So by watching and indulging in pornography, we're able to release tension without hurting anyone else. This is the most popular argument made for pornography. 
This is exactly the same argument that is made for the legalization of prostitution. You research the legalization of prostitution and the arguments that they make for it, the catharsis argument is one of the arguments they make. Well, what about all these poor guys that you know, they don't have a wife and they're widowers or they're single or they can't get a date and this and that. You know, prostitutes are serving a very you know, fine function for our society, for these lonely men. Yeah, this, is, this is the argument. Well, they make the same argument for pornography. Argument number two, freedom of speech. We're in America. We're in America. It's a free country and we, we are allowed to say or show anything we want to. Uh, you, can, you can't censor this because if you censor some part of pornography, where will the censorship uh, lead to or end? You know, that's, that's what's called the slippery slope argument. Well, you can't use the slippery slope argument for everything, you know. People don't have to watch or they don't have to read. Uh, and so producers should be allowed to write or film or stage whatever they wish. And if people don't like it, they can just turn it off. They don't have to go to Pornhub. They don't have to consume pornography. Nobody's twisting their arm. That's an argument. I'll, I'll answer that in a minute here, but that's the argument. And then the third argument, which is really the true argument, it's profitable. Oh yeah, it's profitable. The economic argument, which is the most, prof, uh, the most powerful argument, the money made on the internet. And aside from that money, pornography is a very profitable business, taking in billions of dollars per year alone in print and billions more in film per year. You know, uh, I, I, I don't want to go over all of these things, but you know, there's not just videos, there's, uh, you know, 900 numbers where you can speak in a certain way uh, to someone at the other end of the line. Uh, one stat that I found, there are 20,000 porno bookstores in the United States, 20,000 of them. There are 900 uh, movie houses that show only uh, pornography. Here's the one that really got to me. There are 250 different kinds of child pornography magazines showing everything from incest to murder. And you're saying, well, I've never seen that. Well, yeah, they're not selling it at uh, Walgreens. <laughs> Pornography is a very, very profitable and growth industry. I mean, they have their own conventions. You know, like uh, the Oscars and the, you know, the Academy Awards and stuff like that shows, they have the same thing. For actors, well, anyways, performers uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in porn movies. And they get prizes and awards you know, for, what the, for what they do in the gala evening and they're all dressed up in their finery. So those are the, you know, some of the arguments for pornography, arguments against. Well, number one, it's not good for you. <laughs> it's not good for you. The answer to the catharsis argument, it's pornography is definitely not good for you. The idea that porn is good for you has never been backed up with statistics. It's only a theory. Statistics, however, show that with the increase of the distribution of pornography, there is an increase uh, of sexual and violent crime prostitution, incest, and rape. Why do you think we have laws? <laughs> Anybody remember Ted Bundy? Ring a bell? Ted, Mund Ted Bundy was a prolific uh, serial killer. 
I don't know how many women he raped and murdered, uh, but in the dozens. A handsome guy, you know, uh, not at all the image of the serial rapist killer that you normally have, you know. Uh, no, uh, Ted Bundy was a really nice looking guy, well-spoken, well-dressed, you know. He used to lure women into his car uh, by wearing a, uh, a cast, a fake cast on his arm and he'd, he'd, be, he'd go to uh, universities and he'd, he'd, be, he'd drop his books, he had a cane, you know, and he'd drop his books and he had trouble and eventually some co-ed would come along and nice girl and say, hey, sir, are you having any problem? Well, if you could just help me get the books into my car, you know, and, and then he'd lure that girl, his car was parked, you know, he'd lure that girl into the car and then, you know, knock her out, be, you know, just beat her and then kidnap her and, and whatever. The point I'm making with uh, Ted Bundy is that in an interview with him uh, that I heard, uh, that I saw, uh, they asked him, how, how does a guy do this? How do you get to where you were? And he said, oh, pornography. I started with pornography. And I consumed pornography to the point where pornography was just not enough. I had to have the real thrill, the thrill of you know, actually rape. You know, instead of having a rape fantasy, I, I wanted to do it for real. Then I realized that you know, killing is fun. <laughs> killing gets you off and so on and, and so forth. And so it's not good for you, why? Because it's addictive, that's why. It's addictive. It's an addictive uh, substance. Pornography acts as a psychological narcotic. Some people are extremely sensitive to it. Others become hooked with prolonged use. Just like alcohol, some people can have a drink or two or you know, over a number of years, nothing. Other people, one drink, they're hooked. Well, pornography is the, same, is the same way. Like any addiction, pornography develops a craving for something that cannot in itself satisfy. It only produces the desire for itself, but once uh, consumed, cannot satisfy. It only produces the desire for more. You see the, you know, you see the little wheel there? You take it because you crave it. Once you take it, it doesn't satisfy the craving. It only gives you a craving for more. This is why it is a growth industry and why it is so uh, profitable. Why do you think all the tobacco companies now are investing in vaping and stuff like that? Well, because now they have a product that appeals to younger, uh, to younger children. Because cigarettes certainly don't appeal to them anymore. It's not cool anymore to be, uh, <coughs> you know, when you're 12 years old, but vaping, oh, excuse me, you know, big cloud of smoke, your fancy little, you know, gadget there. They work on the same idea your customer becomes addicted to your product. What better way to, key, to, to, you know, to have a growth product? Eventually, the mindless craving for more controls us. Now the kick to pornography is that at the beginning, it provokes a reaction within us, just like alcohol or drugs do, that is pleasant. Drugs or alcohol relax or stimulate us, that's why we take them. Pornography stimulates us emotionally. It's a, it's a smack. It's a, wow. Nothing, nothing ever made me feel that way, that quickly, that powerfully ever before. Of course, sexual arousal is the most common. For some people, however, it arouses aggressive feelings. Uh, it surfaces and articulates our repressed sexual fantasies and it creates new ones for us to ponder. I saw an ad in a, in a, in a video, not in a video store, 
at a video store in its window, it had a big ad and it said, oh man, I mean, talk about, talk about the wicked deviousness of this. The ad said, come in and find yourself. Come in and find yourself. Oh, in other words, come in and find your worst self. The big problem, however, is that like illicit drugs or improper use of prescription drugs, it is not the answer or the method of dealing with repressed desires or fantasies, sexual or otherwise. It just makes things worse. It's like getting drunk when you're depressed. <laughs> you know, you're depressed, so you think you're going to fix that depression by getting drunk. Yeah, that really solves the problem. Repressed feelings, aggression, unsatisfied desire are best dealt with uh, prayer uh, and, and, and the insight that comes with Bible study uh, or counseling or, or a, a, a warm and committed relationship. For most people, God has provided the intimacy and the security of the marriage bed for people to freely express themselves sexually. I mean, that he, he's given that us, to us as a gift, as a blessing. The marriage bed is sacred, why? Because it's just, you know, the two people, the husband and the wife. And because it's sacred, because it's inviolable, because it's permanent, both partners are able to, with time, reveal themselves. Slowly but surely, they reveal themselves. In marriage, we have the perfect setting in which to share our deepest thoughts and explore our own sexuality to the point where we can be satisfied. This is why there's no limit to the creativity that a married couple can enjoy in a mutually developed sexual relationship. Those who consume pornography has, have less desire for sex with their live partner. That's what usually happens. You know, the scenario, especially nowadays, you know, after a couple of years, uh, the husband, usually it's the husband, women, become addicted to pornography, but maybe of the group, 10% would. Usually it's the men, but usually what happens is uh, you're married, it's, it's, it's exciting, it's breathless, it's new, uh, it's creative, da, 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 da. And then, and then the kids show up, you know, and you gotta, you gotta take a break for a couple of years, you know, and so on and so forth. And then what happens, in, What's supposed to happen in most relationships is, well, you know, the kids grow up, we find each other, you know, we find each other again because we've got more time, and, you know, more patience and we carry on with life and we look back and we say, boy, I'm sure glad we hung in there. I'm sure glad that we stuck together because I don't know about you, but in my life, I've realized that God has put a particular pleasure or blessing at every stage of marriage. At the beginning, of course, the obvious things, obvious blessings, you know, children's come along, well, that's those blessings as well, and they grow up. But at every stage of marriage, 40 years, 50 years, you know, I'm 42, Lisa and I are 42 years. There's a blessing at every, stage that God has put that is unique and designed for that particular stage of marriage. But what happens is the old boy gets out there, I'm tired, honey, I'm going to bed. Okay, I'm going to watch TV. And instead of watching TV, he watches porn. And he has his uh, sexual desires uh, satisfied in that way. And it kind of, you know, it works. Everybody's happy. <laughs> and mama gets some sleep. He gets what he wants. 
But it doesn't work in the long run. That's the problem. It doesn't work in the long run. The answer to experiencing the most joyful, creative, satisfying sexuality is found in the freedom that Christ brings and the security that marriage provides, not in the consumption of pornography. Next point is the answer to the social argument. Freedom brings responsibility. You know, when they say we're free to say what we want to say, if you don't like it, you just don't, you don't have to watch. Well, there's an answer to that. And that is that freedom brings responsibility. The purveyors of pornography say that this is a free country. Yeah, this is a free country. You know, we're free to dispose of our garbage. But freedom also provides us the responsibility of not polluting our environment with our garbage. I'm free to throw my garbage out, but I'm not free to kind of litter it all over the street or dump it on your front yard. So we're free to think and we're free to imagine whatever we want, but we're not free to pollute society with a psychological narcotic yeah, we're not free to do that. Porn has the same effect on the brain as crack cocaine. Did you know that? They've done tests with the MRIs. You can take MRIs of the brain, you know, to see the activity of the brain or the response of the brain under the influence of various stimulants. And they've given people, you know, cocaine and they watch the brain light up, certain areas of the brain light up when they take cocaine. They've discovered that they give someone pornography to observe and the same area of the brain lights up in exactly the same way. And so pornography has the same effect on the brain as, you know, drugs, because it is a drug. We are free, yes but we're not free to harm others and pornography has been proven to be harmful, proven to be harmful. And then of course the argument, well, it's profitable. Again, it's not profitable for society. It may be financially profitable to very few, but the overall effect on society in terms of crime, social misery, the lowering of standards, the ruination of marriages is very, very expensive in the long run. Society pays a high price for the damage that pornography causes. So the argument of, against uh, pornography, these are just the secular arguments against pornography. But there is also an argument against pornography from a Christian's perspective, perspective excuse me. That is that uh, involvement in sexual impurity is condemned in the Bible. Socially and psychologically, pornography is harmful. But for the Christian, the most important factor is what God says about it. So let's take a look at a few passages of scripture. Genesis 2.25 says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. What does that say? It shows that men and women, before they sinned, nakedness was a sign of innocence. It was, there was, a, there was a, no, no shame. Then in uh, Genesis chapter three, verse six and seven, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So after the disobedience and sin, then comes guilt and shame and the loss of innocence. And this was manifested by the desire to cover oneself, except for the intimacy within marriage, which is God ordained, nudity still causes guilt and shame. I mean, it's natural. Why? Because we are still sinners and our inability to be naked without shame 
is a reminder of that. No amount of graphic nudity and social acceptance can remove this from our conscience. I mean, some people would rather die, would rather die than be naked in public. They'd rather shoot me instead of taking off my clothing in public. The argument against pornography in the Bible is stated in positive terms. It tells us how we ought to be rather than what we ought not to do. It's why we don't ever see a command that says, thou shalt not consume pornography. It's not there. Pornography is forbidden because it undermines our holiness. Pornography and holiness are incompatible. A holy person is sexually pure and chaste and clean. Christians cannot consume porn and remain holy. And without personal holiness, there's no peace with self or with God. In Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, Paul, the familiar passage, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Our bodies are to be entirely holy all of it holy. Why? To demonstrate who God is. He's holy, therefore we're holy. You know, at the end, we're to, we're to prove what the will of God is. You know, what is the will of God? Well, uh, that we act in such a way that is good and acceptable and perfect. That's what his will is. And pornography has no part in that. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 to 16, he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Our new lives in Christ are evident in that we no longer are involved in sexual impurity. I mean, uh, the, 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 uh, the pagan nations in the promised land, uh, one of the reasons that God wanted them wiped out along with their religion is that most of their religion involved sexual impurity. Acts of sexual impurity were, were part and parcel of their religion. And he was, well, not afraid, but God knew that if, 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 if the Israelites allowed them to stay, they would be perverted by that religion. Why? Because the temptation would be so great. That's why. Then in 1 uh, uh, Corinthians 16, 13, it says, yet the body is not for immorality, sexual immorality, it, uh, but, but it's for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. God does not deny that our bodies desire these things. He's not saying, oh, you'll never desire something which is unclean or you know, something like that. No, 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 no. He, he, he understands we're human, we're sinful, we're subject to temptation and sometimes temptation to things which are ugly and despicable, he knows that. But he says, as Christians, we're reminded that our bodies belong to a holy God and he has a holy purpose for our bodies. And pornography desecrates our bodies. And then in Matthew chapter 5, 27, 28, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so basically when you're consuming pornography, you're committing adultery in your heart. I mean, that's at the, that's at the heart of it. You know, Jesus says, we're guilty when we think unclean or impure thoughts. The object of pornography is to arouse us by putting these thoughts into our minds. 
It's designed for that. The writer is sitting down writing out the script and what they're going to do with the specific purpose of creating arousal and desire in the minds and the hearts of those who are viewing. It's the whole purpose of it is that. I heard the bell. The only sexual fantasy that we should have is for our marriage partner. That's biblical. Solomon says, let your fountain be blessed. Your fountain, what is your fountain in this context? Your fountain is your sex life. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Well, what does that mean rejoice in the wife of your youth in the context of human sexuality? He's saying, enjoy yourselves while you're young, while you have strength, while you have desire, enjoy yourselves. He's saying this. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast, he's talking about how men think of their wives, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. One exhortation after another to the men, you know, to find themselves completely satisfied with their wives. And then the reverse, that the wife find her complete satisfaction in her husband. And in this year, he, he's even not hinting, but suggesting you ought to know what makes each other happy. And if you don't, come on, let's go, let's communicate. Don't think the partner is gonna guess that doesn't always work. <laughs> Our vicarious participation in these acts through pornography uh, has a terrible effects on us spiritually. For example, it hurts our consciences. It destroys our peace of mind and communion with the Lord ultimately separating us forever. I don't know any Christian who watches porn and doesn't feel guilty after. Although if the day comes that you watch porn and you don't feel guilty, you better be careful. That's called losing your soul. That's called your heart, start, your heart is starting to become as hard as stone. You, you, you're getting to the point where you can't repent. It removes our joy of salvation. We're saddened, discouraged. We're discouraged by ourselves. You know, we, 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 we consume pornography, we give in. And then once we've consumed it, we say to ourselves, what's wrong with me? What, what is my problem? And we're saddened, discouraged. We become fearful. We become des desensitized to what is good and pure. We become apologists for lower standards. We begin having a false image of wholesome sex as God has created it. You know, our libido is a fragile thing. Very fragile. Pornography doesn't do it any good. It, it overstimulates it. Just like drugs overstimulate, pornography overstimulates. You know, God, he builds a, a box around us and he says, here's the frontier uh, of, of your stimulation, of your joy, of your satisfaction, uh, of the feelings that you can feel, which are good and pleasant and exciting. I'm, I'm making a box around you so that all these things can be experienced in a positive and wholesome and, 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 and kind of way that, that builds you up. But if you go past that box, if you go past that line, you're going to get into trouble. And that's what pornography does. It overstimulates, it floods the brain uh, with overstimulation. And yes, it's pleasant, it's great. You know, it's wonderful at the beginning. I never felt anything, I never, uh, yeah, sure. And then after a while, you don't feel anything at all. 
And that's the punishment you get for going past the line that God draws for us. You know, Jesus said that we can tell a tree by its fruit. Well, this is some of the fruit that pornography produces in us spiritually. So breaking the habit, I've got just a couple of minutes left and if you'll just be patient with me, pass the bell here. Breaking the habit. So pornography, pornography becomes a habit. And like all habits, we eventually lose the kick, but we, but we retain the craving and we go into a vicious cycle where the objective no longer is enjoyment of the kick, but the satisfaction of the craving, which never comes. It's like smoking, you know. Eventually you just smoke because you have the craving. So how do we break the cycle? Number one, recognize that it's wrong. That's number one, this is wrong. I'm not doing what's right. You know, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, that's, that's, that's acknowledging that the thing is wrong. Without acknowledging the fact that it is morally wrong and sinful, the cycle never is broken. Most people just try to control their addictions rather than break them. To break it, you must first acknowledge what it is. It's a sin. The impure do not inherit the kingdom and the sooner they realize it, the sooner they win the victory. Galatians 5, 19. This is the beginning of the end for the sinful habit when you acknowledge its sinfulness. Quickly, number two, accept forgiveness. 1 John 9, 10. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us. The problem with porn, as with other sexual sins, is that it is a, it's committed against self, and thus the scars run very deeply. God promises forgiveness. When we acknowledge uh, one sin and forsake it, he forgives us, and we need to accept this. Even if the craving remains for a while as a vestige of this behavior, the sin and the guilt and the shame and the condemnation are washed away by the blood of Christ and we have to accept that. And as long as the battle rages on, every time we go to God for help and forgiveness, we are totally renewed in his eyes and we can stand before him without shame, even if we are ashamed of ourselves. And then of course, get some help. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. People who are addicted uh, have lost the ability in one area of their lives to control themselves. They need help. Those who are fighting this habit need to get help. Start with prayer by going to God about this on a regular basis. John says that Christ is a constant intercessor for us with God. Nothing surprises or discourages God. He will always listen and always help. Number two, share your struggle with a trusted friend. Your spouse, if you're married, she or he is your best friend, your trusted uh, advisor in things like this. You can pray together and you can grow closer together and you can share the burden together. And then thirdly, uh, get professional help if prayer and sharing uh, you know, are not enough. Uh, the Bible says there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Sometimes a habit is a symptom of deeper problems that are manifesting themselves in this way. Loneliness or depression or anger. The best way to face this is with courage and hope that a Christian counselor can provide. We need to remember that God can use one struggle with this particularly damaging sin to draw a person closer to himself and to develop within that person a more compassionate spirit towards other people and their sin. Of course, there are other resources to help protect us and our homes from this uh, vice, you know, computer filters and chips and settings to block our TVs because it's easy to accidentally go to one of these sites by typing in the wrong thing. The best protection, however, is to be vigilant as to what you permit into your house and into your hearts. One last verse of prayer, of passage of scripture. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. 
just remember, watch what you watch and what others are watching in your house because God is watching you, okay? All right, well, that's our lesson on pornography and behavior for this week. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. Thank you.